really interesting uh, winning proposals that we'll have an opportunity to discuss sequentially in turn. We have each uh, uh, representative of each of the uh, proposal groups uh, here with us today in person. We have a nice audience. Um, and let me just introduce myself and then briefly ask my co-panelists to introduce uh, themselves as well as we begin this conversation. I'm Peter Frumhoff. I'm the Director of Science and Policy at the Union of Concerned Scientists. I don't know if people may not know who we are. We're a national nonprofit working to bring science to bear on informing and motivated public policy across a range of issues, mostly focused on the U.S. and with a very large focus on climate and energy as well as on sustainable agriculture, obviously of main interest to this work. I'm actually a tropical forest ecologist by training uh, and uh, background, and, and so I'm very keen to think with our panelists today about the relationship between their proposals and the opportunities to scale them up as we think about opportunities to um, uh, bring down our emissions through the crowdsourcing approach that this uh, uh, this collaboration has brought to the conversation yesterday and today. Um, so I will moderate the panel. I'll have some comments myself on the proposals, but um, we'll also be asking my co-panelists to be speaking. So let me ask them each to introduce themselves briefly in any opening remarks you wish to make. Um, I'm Jock Heron. I'm uh, uh, at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. I run a small uh, lab that's focused on digital cities and health and wellness. Uh, that's supported by Humana. We're now sort of evolving into much more of a focus on food and food systems as they affect both population health and ecological health. And I have a funny background, I guess, of sorts, and that I have started up some small, small technology companies. And I have uh, spent a fair amount of time in the business world, but also I co manage some family farms that have been. Uh, uh, the family back to the 1830s, so at least I have some sense of how agriculture works and a degree in uh, uh, landscape ecology, uh, but I don't pretend to be an ecologist, but sort of an eclectic background, and I think this has been a very appealing process to read through these things, which is great. So it's sort of a, an eclectic, I guess, is the way I would describe myself. Christine. I'm Christina Ingersoll. I am not a stranger to MIT. I work here for the Sustainability Initiative at the MIT Sloan School. Um, I'm a graduate of the Sloan School and uh, the first MBA student to receive the Sustainability Certificate, which is a, an option through our, our business program. Um, and I'm currently the, uh, the coordinator for Strategic Systems Integration with the Committee on Sustainability Assessment, COSA. <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, where I, I manage uh, the, the life cycle of the data that COSA collects from uh, smallholder farmers, primarily in developing countries, um, and primarily farmers of, of cocoa and, and coffee, so an agroforestry product. Um, I also have a somewhat eclectic background. I'm an environmental scientist originally and have done uh, some farming on a relatively small scale and continue to have a very active garden, so I, this uh, getting to read about these projects was quite appealing, and I look forward to speaking more. Okay, well, thanks to each of you for uh, joining us, and we're going to have uh, about a half an hour for each of the three uh, proposals to um, have some opening remarks, to share the video, uh, and then open up a dialogue both with the panelists and, as appropriate and of interest, with the audience both here and if anybody wants to join in virtually, that would be great. Rather than ask each of you to introduce yourselves now, let me just do this sequentially in the turn of the uh, of the discussion. And we're simply going to do this in the order of the uh, proposals as they're listed on the on the program. We did think about doing these all together, but the proposals are really quite different uh, in terms of their geography, their technical focus, and their approach. And so we really wanted to give them each a, a really separate and distinctive opportunity for, for dialogue. Um, and the first two, I should just say, are within the framework of agriculture and forestry. And remember, the, the thematic question that drove these were, and I'll just say it, read it now, is which activities can best reduce climate impacts and enhance resilient adaptation to climate change in agriculture and forestry. So um, we're going to start with the proposal uh, on woody agriculture, breeding and implementing uh, hazelnut and chestnut as stable crops. And let's take it away. Please introduce yourself and, and walk us through with your uh, video as well. Uh, OK. Uh, the feed us. The, uh, <laughs> there you go. Um, uh, the video may be the best introduction, and then I can add stuff. Why don't you introduce that. yourself at the beginning? Uh, yeah, I'm, my name is Philip Rudder. I'm the founder of Badger Set Research. Uh, I had a previous existence. I founded and uh, created the American Chestnut Foundation, which I just spoke at the 30th annual meeting of. Uh, to restore the American chestnut to the forest. And that actually was a uh, another exercise in crowdsourcing. But I had to take a dead horse and beat it back into life and convince crowds that this was worth doing. And I had to create 
uh, the crowd from scratch. So we're familiar. Uh, Woody Agriculture is another very large social project, uh, convincing people that this makes sense. And uh, uh, my background actually is evolutionary ecology, but I baffled my uh, professors in 1975. They had no idea what that was. There was no such thing. Um, uh, and uh, so I jumped, jumped the tracks and left after completing all the work for the PhD. I'm what's called an ABD, all but dissertation. But then we found ourselves trying to figure out what happens next, and this was what happened next. Great. Well, please um, Great. walk us through the, the, uh, the video if you want to introduce it, and then uh, we'll show it. Uh, yep. Uh, let's, let's show it. The video okay. uh, explains. Plants capture three times the carbon of annual crops. The first 30 years of development at Badger Set Farm are proof. Now we scale up. We are Badger Set Research Corporation, working in Minnesota since 1978. We have six staff members, 25 stockholders, and about a thousand growers of all sizes across North America. Woody Agriculture is defined as the intensive production of staple agricultural commodities using highly domesticated woody fragile plants. Crop models under development utilize our multi species hybrid gene pools of hazel, chestnut, and pecan. Hybrid hazels can provide a drop in replacement for soybeans, equal food, equal utility, equal machine ability, but no tillage. We're drastically reduced pesticide and fossil fuel inputs and much greater genetic diversity and biodiversity. The agriculture was conceived for soil and water conservation and is good at it. And trees are good at carbon capture. Hybrid poplar mixes almost three times as much carbon per year as corn. If woody plants were planted on half the world's annual crop land, they could fix at least 10 megatons more carbon per year than current crops with no decrease in food production. Some carbon will be sequestered long term in the soil, including biochar production and incorporation that part of the system results in a very large, very long term carbon sink. The Woody Egg Farmer's budget is helped by great reduction of fossil fuel, no tillage. The fields provide multiple products for the farmer each year, no one-trick ponies allowed. These crops are unaffected by droughts and floods that destroy standard field crops. They carry out precedented genetic diversity that gives them hope of adapting to climate shifts. High biodiversity is a core tool of the system for managing pests from mammals and birds to insects and fungi. We'll point out, since we're talking about food, these crops are not only first rate nutrition, egg quality, protein, oils, equals olive oil. They're tasty. Yes, this is a big project. Initial plantings were made in 1981. Our first 10 years went to testing concepts of our unorthodox breeding. In 1990, we began scaling up. We now have enough hazel production to begin serious work on machinery for harvest and post harvest. Multiple independent growers using our genetics are now actively scaling up. Whether this technology addresses global carbon depends not on if it works, but how rapidly it can be adopted. We are ready to expand development of these crops, particularly the hazels. With your help, we will establish a test and breeding farm in Canada where there is substantial interest. Year one, initial shape depth, two to 500 plants. Year two, about 2,000 more. In year six through 12, we will evaluate genetics and begin breeding for local conditions, and we'll use the planting for grower training. Years 12 through 20 will have the first coppice cull and replanting with continued breeding. There are growers in Ontario who are keenly interested in working with us to establish this planting. We need capital for travel to finish site selection and begin training. The grand prize would fund the first year of this project and get it in the ground. Woody agriculture is staple food production with advanced woody crops. Hybrid hazels can replace soybeans, add simultaneous biomass production, and greatly improve soil, water, and ecological conservation for land now in group crops. They could capture enough carbon to address global warming. We need additional production capacity now. Yeah. <laughs> great, thank you. Let me uh, first turn to Jock. We'll do this in the lab right, interaction great. after okay, each of us. Great. Um, anyway, I think it's great. And I, one of the things that struck me as I was going through this and also hearing the talk a little bit earlier is that there's, you know, there's been a web 1.0, web 2.0 in terms of connecting people. There really needs to be a 3.0, and that's really to get people out into the field. And that is where the action is. And I think that's a fundamental kind of view here. It's very important to have the apps. I don't take anything away from that. But I think it's fascinating that sort of a technology-based source has actually produced some really pretty interesting hands-on things. I think that's great. 
The second thing that's related is there's a lot more to the world than computer science, as important as it is, the world of agronomy and things like that are really critical in terms of solving these things. And so I think having that uh, be kind of a basis for the way this has been thought out, I think, is really wonderful. So I think that's great. Um, I do have some questions, and I think one of the things is to raise questions, uh, which I think is what makes this useful, but I'd start by saying, but clearly kind of nuts are off people, <laughs> nuts in the sense of edible nuts, are off people's radar screen, basically. They are, as you say, extraordinarily nutritious. Um, I think that even actually, hard to believe, it's sort of Bush's uh, Secretary of Agriculture, I second one, was saying we're not going to change the ag bill in terms of the basic commodity crops, but at least we should be subsidizing fruit and nuts and things like that. And so there's a really kind of, it is off the radar screen. I think that's a, that's a big flaw. And I think that you've identified an area that's very important. And hazelnuts clearly are great nuts, and while that's a whole series of others, but I think that makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, I guess from a, from a proposal standpoint, I do have some questions about the economics, just in terms of the viability of it. And I'd also really like to test the premise of, of how, I, I personally think it would be incredibly risky to look at really great arable soil and say that sort of nut trees are a substitute for crops for that, mm -hmm. given the challenges that we have just in terms of feeding people. And so I think that, so I, from my perspective, would tend to focus on not marginal lands, but sort of lands that sort of everything from hedgerows and other parts of, of farming land that probably can be more productively used or isn't such a substitute. When I think of soybeans, which was not a cash crop at all 20 years ago, now it is a big crash crop. From a risk standpoint, for a farmer, you have a certain amount of latitude. If you do soybeans, you can switch things depending on market changes. And I think that's not addressed here. There, there's certainly nutritional kind of comparability between soybeans and between the nuts, et cetera, which I think is really great. But I think if you went all for one, you know, kind of if actually do a total switch, uh, switch, you'd be adding a lot more risk to the system, basically, for um, uh, uh, for a farmer, basically. So I, I'm just, I just raised that as a, as a question. Um, I think in terms of the uh, proposal itself, I think it would be interesting to think about how you would brand these nuts. Um, how do you kind of make them special? Uh, down in Fairhope uh, in Alabama, which is sort of one of the Henry George kind of communities, they produce tremendous amounts of pecans. And it's, it's a real business, but there's something about Fairhope pecans. So you might think in terms of how you kind of brand something special, because I think how this really works from an economic standpoint is the area that I would have really want to drill down in terms of capital investments are, are for land are very substantial and so how that kind of works isn't quite so clear to me but I really love the way you're looking at it true of all the proposals I think that people are thinking here in terms both long horizon 2083 is great and also in terms of how you could generalize generalize something how you could replicate how you could kind of take a small idea and I mean, it's a big idea but in a, in a defined location and be able to uh, generalized from it, so a lot of other. So I love that part of it. So I think there are a lot of good things, but I do have a couple questions. Right. There's a lot there to chew on. Yeah. Uh, right, um, right. I, I would just like a very quick response if you can. And then I'll, I, I'll try. I, I'd like to invite you to come and take our three-day short course next like spring. <laughs> <laughs> There's two hours on marketing. Yeah. Uh, one of the one of the credentials I have that I did not mention. I used to be president of the Northern Nut Growers Association. Ooh. And there's a great deal of marketing and branding uh, involved there too. So I'm I'm very uh, familiar with that. Uh, one of the things that crowds generate, and we now we actually have the you saw the map with the uh, different plantings. We have approximately 200 growers of hazelnuts who are intending to actually make a crop out of it, and we are actually trying to slow them down. One of the things crowds generate is noise and wackos, and we already have noise right. and wackos in this operation. I had to talk one of the growers out of buying a state-of-the-art German oil press, which had the capability of pressing uh, uh, 20 tons a week. He had four acres of hazelnuts. Mm -hmm. There's no chance he's going to be able to use that machine, right. but he was, he was that enthusiastic. So we actually have to rein all of that uh, stuff in. Uh, and in terms of, uh, you know, we're not we're not suggesting that uh, soybeans be abandoned, uh, but there are places where they are inappropriate. Actually, my region is one. Soybeans do not belong on the soils in my region. Uh, they are very de very destructive, cause a tremendous amount of erosion. Uh, but we have uh, we have growers who are uh, integrating as a way to step up. They put in hazels at 20 foot spacings in alfalfa, uh, grow and rotate hay. While they while the hazels are getting up into it production, which is like yeah, we we recommend that they that the hazels not be harvested until they're five years old. We want them to have the nuts pulled off up until then, so that they uh, develop the root structure 
uh, you know, genetically, we can do better than that later, but that's genetically that's where we are right now. We don't want them to produce before then. Um, so there, we we try to encourage people to get into it in steps. Not we wait every every year. We have somebody who uh, contests. I want to put in 20 acres. I said, don't don't do right. that. Uh, you know, put in half an acre this year. If you like it, put in two acres next year, and then we'll talk. So. That's great. That's a little less clear to post, but that's very well said. I think right. that's a smart, integrated strategy as opposed to all or nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Christina. Um, thanks for, for this excellent presentation. And, and your comments actually help uh, with, with some of the, the questions that I've had as well while reviewing your, uh, your video and some of the other materials that you've presented and, um, and, and your company. I, I didn't mention that I was a, a biologist in Minnesota, so I'm familiar with the, the landscape and forest landscape. And um, I am, uh, I think most ecologists are quite convinced that it is uh, that growing trees as opposed to annual uh, crops has the potential to sequester carbon. You've made a very compelling case for that. Um, it seems sort of un unequivocally true that uh, that there is a carbon sequestration potential. Um, I'm actually, I think this builds somewhat on what Jock was saying, but I, I think the presentation might actually be in some ways more compelling with greater focus, which you've just referred to, that you're trying to rein in some of the enthusiasm. Yeah. But you mentioned the, the chestnuts, the pecans, right? And yes. also hazelnuts. Right. And also um, working on developing new forms of machinery, working on the genetics and future plans to further develop genetics. And then quite a wide range of end products, of biodiesel, mm -hmm. biomass, yep. uh, edible oil, um, in addition to the biodiesel oil, uh, and also the edible nuts, um, which is fantastic. But it ends up feeling like, what is, what's, what's the core strength? And it sounds like you actually know that. But from reading the presentation, I had right. some concern that the, the case for having this be a, a downscalable project um, could actually be quite compelling, that this is effective even on four acres, because um, it sounds like it could be. Or effective on you know 50% of variable land, which is where you'll find people might disagree. But <laughs> but to make the case clearly that it's uh, it's scalable up and down, uh, I, I think I think could be true. Sure, um, you know one of the things that uh, uh, folks really need to understand this is a a genuinely different agricultural paradigm in in at least three different ways. Uh, woody plants are radically different from annual plants so in forest you know I, t I try to I wish there were they are so different I wish we had something besides plant to call woodies they are ancient uh, very sophisticated organisms that live very long lifespans and they have tricks in their books that the annuals simply don't do uh, at all and uh, uh, so we're you know we're relying on an utterly different organism here uh, the uh, 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 the requirements for the organisms are quite different. The requirement from the farmers are quite different. Annual agriculture is an emergency. Every, every, you know, you've got to get the crop in instantly. You've got to get it uh, cultivated, sprayed instantly. You've got to get it harvested instantly. And uh, it, with actually with the woodies, it's much more lackadaisical. You walk through and say, I've got to get this done sometime this month. And it's a very different person. But uh, one, of the, one of the great failures of most of the... Um, uh, attempts to uh, alter crops for sustainable agriculture is constantly coming up with one-trick ponies like uh, you know hybrid poplar hybrid willow you can't do anything with it but haul it down to the plant which has to be within 50 miles those are farmer killer crops and one of the intentions here is to give uh, uh, farmers multiple options now the uh, you know if you have a a, uh, a mature hazel crop in place. Uh, no, you can't switch to corn next year. You could switch to hay next year if you really wanted to. You can coppice them. These are all designed to be coppiced uh, and the wood harvested periodically as well. So you could switch that way, but you also you have the ability to switch. Uh, there are uh, four or five different wood products that can come out of this. Uh, and you lose nut production for a year or two when you go through a coppice phase. But it's it's uh, intended to be highly diverse and conserve farmers so they don't go broke. Uh, one of the one of the uh, uh, aspects that we simply are not able to cram into three minutes is when when you attempt to measure uh, uh, the basic 
productivity potential for different landscapes. We have a we have a, a paper from the 50s, which attempted to find a different way to measure uh, rather than measuring net primary productivity, which is so slippery and so so difficult. And this was uh, uh, Don Lawrence, a botanist at the University of Minnesota, and what he did was actually measure the total chlorophyll in different biomes and what he you know he measured the chlorophyll in corn and you get this nice annual curve you measure the total chlorophyll in prairie systems which is quite low over the entire year uh, uh, savannas are a little bit higher and oak forest is massively greater than anything else there is an enormous actual photosynthetic capability in woody plant systems that grassy plant systems simply don't share. So it gives you great, a great deal more energy that you can uh, uh, manipulate that way. The, the, the uh, uh, genetics that we're doing is very novel, uh, and uh, there are not that many people who understand it. One of, the, one of the proudest moments of my life was when I was showing Michael Rosenzweig, someone you may know, showing him my genetics, and he, we got to slide seven, and he said, Wait a minute. Go back. No, we went back. Okay. <laughs> so it's it's complex, but it's based on uh, hybrid swarms, which are something that's well documented in, in uh, populations biology. I've created artificial hybrid swarms, and then uh, intentionally, you do generate diversity that does not exist in nature. Much of it is useful for domestication, uh, but there's also a tremendous amount of junk that you have to measure and discard. Uh, as well, so it's it's complex. Can I make one very quick point to that? Because what you made is a great point, but not at all clear in here. Is that farmers do get a huge amount of trouble when they switch from you know try to do both you know annuals plus livestock because that is a whole different thing. I think the switch from annuals to perennials to woody plants isn't such a big leap actually. And if you look at uh, how you manage a whole farm, we do lots of walnut trees, for instance, we most of the timber. But it's all kind of works quite nicely because sometimes there are hedgerows, but there is this timber value that goes into it. So the mindset is much more kind of linked there, uh, I think, than it is instead sure. that and that's that makes it more likely to be successful. I think that is it was I designed it to be something that my neighbors who grow yes, corn, exactly. beans, and beef can adapt. It's right. one of the, it's one of the failures of permaculture, which is a lovely concept. But my neighbors who grow 800 acres of beans and corn cannot adopt that technology. They don't have the skills. They don't want to get the skills, and they can't do it. Uh, so, thank you for this proposal. I have a couple of comments and questions for you as well, um, and then we'll open up for a few minutes more broadly. I really like what you did. I really thought the proposal was well written and the video compelling. I want to put this a little bit more in the carbon and climate context specifically, sure. if we could. Um, so uh, uh, we're clearly going to need very large-scale uh, carbon uptake from the atmosphere over the course of this century, in addition to reducing emissions to stabilize the climate. And this is obviously an important approach to potentially doing so at scale. One of the things I worry about is making sure that as you highlight what products can be used as outputs for consumption, for example, or for use as oils, that we're actually getting the carbon benefits that um, might be achieved in part through the increase in woody biomass relative mm -hmm. to um, uh, other crops. So, for example, you showed as a compelling, attractive um, marketing piece in your video, um, Nutella. Right. We all love Nutella. I certainly do. <laughs> but Nutella, just to kind of take this through, is um, made not only with hazelnuts but also with palm oil. Palm oil, right? yes. Ooh. And I'm sure our Cool Foods folks uh, um, would um, look yes. askance at that yeah. in terms of yeah. its yes. net carbon yes. consequences yes. because, as most people um, probably know, palm oil, by and large, is grown at the expense of natural forests in Malaysia and in Indonesia and, um, uh, and therefore has a net negative carbon consequence. And so you want to make sure, both in terms of your marketing and in your in your carbon calculations and your metrics, that you're getting the benefits that you're intending to sure. from the development of these crops. So I just encourage you to think about that, both in how you market it and how you calculate mm -hmm. um, from the in-product perspective. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and that obviously then asks the question, what are the in-products? How much can this be scaled up? What not just in terms of supply, but in terms of demand. What's the demand side of the equation for, mm -hmm. for example, for hazelnuts? Right. And so I'll ask you to speak to that in a moment. The other piece is around the adaptation uh, side of the conversation. One of the, uh, and I'm not an ag person per se, but one of the um, uh, potential challenges with long-lived perennial 
uh, woody crops is that they're less amenable to substitution over time mm -hmm. um, to deal with a changing climate, both increasing variability and directional change, whether it be heat or drought or or uh, or, 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 or other uh, or flooding, um, uh, in the context of a changing climate. And and so, what's so I'm curious to know how you think about the resilience. Right. of these crops to uh, climate change right. given that they're intended to be uh, there for many decades, which of course is attractive from sure. a mitigation perspective. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, uh, the gene pool is enormous. We've actually done the, the, the numbers and uh, for years uh, I was telling people just off the seat of my pants that on our farm in Minnesota we have more basic genetic diversity in this hybrid swarm of hazels than exists in the entire world corn genome. And when my son got back with his PhD and is much better at calculus than I am, I said, calculate it. And uh, I underestimated drastically. When you mix multiple species, you generate, generate huge numbers of combinations. Uh, some, of the, some of the results are truly outstanding. I, you know, I, um, I, I, I clearly underestimated my audience when I put the Nutella up there. Uh, because you guys, you guys did pick up the palm oil, but it, mostly my audiences just say, "Oh yes, yummy," and go from <laughs> go go from there, which is what we were intending. Uh, but one of the, one of the things that that has happened uh, in our in our gene pool to just to demonstrate the uh, the diversity, we've had hazels germinate in the greenhouse, grow to the age of four weeks, and flower. And the flowers that they have are not hazel flowers at all. They don't even belong in the Betulaceae. They are ancient insect pollinated structures, not wind pollinated. And what it means is we have re-exposed ancient diversity that is still there and is still functional. The, uh, uh, the diversity that we have is really staggering. Are you uh, familiar with the Kazakh apples? Okay, my my understanding. I got one one nod there, so I'll, I'll, I'll try. When the when the when when the Romans and the Chinese started grafting apples and grapes and peaches, the Kazakhs started selecting apples to come true from seed. It's now the center of diversity for apples. All the apple breeders in the world go there to get the diversity that they need, and they succeeded. There are apple forests in Kazakhstan where you can go in and pick the fruit and eat it. And it, that's what we're doing, is generating gene pools. We are, are uh, we do use a little bit of cloning, but it's primarily for scientific purposes. We do not uh, expect to wind up with clonal fields. That's a dead end. That will kill you. Uh, and that's that's quite clear. So we, when when we move to uh, uh, to uh, uh, Canada, for example, we will move to the top 50 percent of the gene pool that we expect to be adapted there. But then for 10 years, we'll be finding uh, plants that are specifically uh, adapted in that area, and then rebuild the diversity from that once you've got the local adaptation. So the uh, the diversity we have to work with is really unprecedented. It's enormous. Make it. Just, just one uh, follow-up comment that I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure you have thought about, and this is, uh, this is from the sort of MBA perspective and not the uh, biologist perspective. Um, thinking about an end user, thinking about uh, the, the demand side for something like an edible nut or an edible oil, the messaging around genetics is such a hot topic that phrases like "we have genetic diversity that doesn't exist in nature." Are, <laughs> might not be the tagline you put on. Oh no, no, nuts, sure. Yeah. But um, no. <laughs> it's. It, I mean, it's very compelling. But it does. It sounds a little mysterious. Some people might find that quite intriguing. Mm -hmm. Some people might find that a turnoff. Right. Sure. Well, it is. You know, we can say very clearly this is is not genetic engineering. This is the mimic of a natural process. This is what nature actually does when climate changes and species come into contact that have not been in contact before. This is probably the most common way new species are formed in the natural world, and that's what that's what we're doing. Um, yeah. So I do want to engage our audience if we can um, before we turn uh, to the next proposal. Is there anybody? Here, or if there's anybody online uh, who wants to uh, weigh in with a, a quick question or comment, we'd welcome. You. I have, go ahead, go, go. I, I think you'll need a microphone. Um, Use this if you like. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so I'm actually on the team. I just wanted to uh, put in a couple of things about resilience and markets. Uh, the the current market for Hazels is nowhere near satisfied, uh, and so while we say it's a drop-in replacement for soybeans, it's going to be a long time before we're actually doing the same thing with Hazels as, as are currently be done, being done with soybeans. Right. Yeah, that, that, that'll that'll absorb everything that can be yeah. produced for the next 50 years, most likely. Uh, and uh, though, so there's that as far as the demand side goes. Uh, and then as far as resilience goes, uh, the woody plants, the the hazels are kind of expecting to live 500 to 1,000 years, we think. Uh, and that's an impressive sort of thing. The the wild hazels, <laughs> you know, that we've seen doing dermplasm collection, uh, and so, you know, that's an impressive thing. You grow wherever your seed happened to fall, and you sit there and deal with everything for 500 to 1,000 years. And so there's inherent inherent resilience in kind of the woody uh, sort of way of doing things. So that's uh, a big part of what's going on, too. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank I you very much for that proposal. We can all yep. All right, next up we have Pia Jensen, I believe, um, speaking on the collaborative proposal on carbon sink economic driver and medicinal plant preservation in Nicaragua. Pia. Thank you. Um, it's a, a great honor to be here. Um, my background in agriculture started as a child uh, collecting snails and, and weeds from my father's garden in our yards. And then I studied agriculture in high school, loved it so much I took the course again and in junior college right after went into forestry and then horticultural management and business management in horticulture and then landed in the environmental studies type of field and continued later with environmental studies and planning, land use planning and so I have a wide array of input of information regarding agriculture and economics and, and job creation. I've worked with nonprofit organizations uh, most recently, 2009, I was working as a compliance manager for an early learning coalition with their grants management. Um, so with that background, when I discovered Sekali in Esteli, Nicaragua, I offered to help them promote and find funding for their projects. They have several things that they're doing, and one is uh, medicinal plant preservation, and they're, they're now hooked up with the seed sanctuary, which is a very cool deal. And I was already involved with Climate CoLab, and they told me they had a reforestation idea, and I said, well, this is this is perfect for Climate CoLab. The, the science on tropical trees, the forest, is a huge amount of carbon capture. Um, and in particular, there's one tree that I find very impressive, the Genizaro, which looks like it's ancient when it's young, and it, and it captures 28.5 tons of carbon per year per tree. Um, so it's a, a pretty fantastic set of trees they have to work with down there. Um, and the, the, the people, even though it was very difficult getting a lot of support from people because they have a hard time conceiving of going outside of Facebook and, and supporting it through this system, which I felt was pretty safe, um, they love the program because they know since 1970s when the Sandinistas and Somoza War was going on that they have decimated their forests. They've, they've completely wiped them out in some areas. Some, some spaces there's only small patches of trees left and currently they still are decimating their forests with daily use of wood for cooking. You see these guys coming out of the forest every day with a bicycle load of wood that they cut to keep their fire load going. Um, so when I hooked up with Sekali, they were not very familiar with the whole foundation grant seeking process and I've helped them get to this point and uh, it's very exciting and very challenging at the same time because our cultural differences and understanding how foundation money works didn't meet at all and so there's, a, there's been a lot of education both directions on how to manage that and I'm just really excited to be here with this project. Why don't we show the video and then launch Excellent, it thank you. Uh, from the 70s. 
Asociación de Cargadores de Promotores de Salud Comunitaria de Secaria tiene entre sus bienes objetivos preservar la salud de la población nicaragüense, así como impulsar acciones que ayuden a conservar y a proteger el medio ambiente. Este proyecto de reforestación que vamos a impulsar tiene provocar un impacto ecológico, un impacto social, un impacto económico, porque se sembrarán plantas de diversas índoles que tienen multiplicidad de uso. Y así la selección de diferentes árboles para que el compañero que va a participar en el proyecto tome conciencia de la importancia de cada especie y así quiera conservar y garantice la sostenibilidad de este proyecto. ¿En qué consiste? Se sembrarán 750 hectáreas con un trabajo de 250 hectáreas por año y 100.000 arbolitos. También todo esto se hará bajo la metodología de la agricultura orgánica con el fin de preservar el ambiente y disminuir la utilización de tanto veneno dañino que nos ha afectado. Eh, el área de trabajo va a ser en 10 municipios de Nicaragua. Can kind of not be sustained, but I think there's a lot in here to, to really like. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, and actually, we didn't really delve too much into the sustainability right. aspect for the economic <laughs> model. Um, they currently are a medicinal farming clinic, so they right. do receive funding through that. Uh, six years ago, the Nicaraguan government stopped funding and kicked out a bunch of NGOs. And so they've been getting along, kind of hobbling along. And one of the things with the myco and, and biochar that I see is that that is something that would need an educational piece to get the farmers on board with it. They do have really good soil in Nicaragua. Um, in that area in particular, it's very agricultural. Unlike Costa Rica, a lot of the soil is depleted there. Um, and so it would take some demonstrations to them to show them how much larger the root systems are, how long you can go in between your watering spin, but then to be able to sell them and, and even actually give them the knowledge on how to create myco themselves because that's something that I always go back to is you don't give the fisherman the fish, you give him the fishing pole uh, because that is the sustainability piece is, is self-empowerment. Um, so I think that the economic model uh, initially resides in the fact that you're actually providing people with access to more foods and more livestock feed so that they're cutting their costs. They don't have to go to another farmer to receive that. They can do it themselves. Um, so I think my, my sentiment is very similar to, to Jacques. This is an impressive project. The, the emphasis on the, the local partnership, that this is in many ways uh, initiated by people who do live in Nicaragua um, and, and have this emphasis on uh, encouraging a sense of stewardship over, over the land that, uh, in which they live. That's, that's, that's great. That seems like really you know, the actual residing in place, caring for place that, um, that a, a sustainable carbon sequestration and economic sustainability project really needs. So um, fantastic and great to have you as a representative to um, uh, speak for that group. I know there was some comment about we should do more of this in Spanish, and I, uh, <laughs> I agree. That's true. That is a, um, I'm going to have to brush up on mine, but uh, that it is certainly an area of the world where the, the resilience to climate change or the susceptibility um, is, is a very uh, present issue. So yeah. um, great to be doing work in that area. Um, I, I'm curious about the land itself. Um, 750 hectares is a uh, substantial amount of land. That's that's uh, more than any land owned by the farmers that my organization uh, works with in Nicaragua. Um, mm. And uh, I'm curious about how it is owned, how what the structure of the ownership is. And I mean, in part because um, for for the so there's many ways to make uh, a project like this have uh, positive social impacts locally. But for the carbon sequestration, some degree of permanence, some length to the life of these trees um, is, is ultimately important. So I, I just wasn't clear on that from your presentation. Yeah, and, and these are questions that actually came up recently. I went back to Sekali and, and spoke with them in depth with an, in, with an interpreter a gentleman who's a Nicaraguan, his English skills are wonderful and his, of course his Nicaraguan Spanish is even better and they have uh, direct ties with the, the one legislative person that's never always the same person but the position remains constant and that's the secretario at the top level of the Nicaraguan government. They've always maintained a good relationship with that person. Most of the lands are municipal lands some of them are private owners and in fact since the project began and I started promoting it private owners have come to me and said I would love to see this happen and I'm willing to let you use my land to do this project and one of the the biggest concerns that's come out of this the sustainable aspect is the security making sure that they don't just go cut those trees down because that's their habit that's what they're used to doing. And so in Nicaragua you have a lot of people who are hired to stand around with their gun and make sure that people aren't doing things on the land that they're not supposed to be doing. It's not a it's a it's one of those low wage jobs that's easy to do and there's lots of guys with lots of guns down there. And it's not it's not a, it's not a threat kind of thing. They're there for security. I felt very safe being in Nicaragua because of that. Um, and so being able to sustain it would, if this project were to win, we would go ahead and use the services of trust law 
and develop the contracts for deeds for the land to make sure that everybody's on board with making sure that this is what this project is about, is long-term sustainability, and that there's a responsibility on the landowner side, you know, not just the municipalities, but the private landowners. And that was one thing that I really had a big challenge was, was encouraging Sekali to say, yes, we want the lawyer services, because they really didn't understand what that was about. Um, so that is a piece that would come in if we get to further develop the project mm -hmm. to make sure that it does remain sustainable and that everybody's on board with the idea of keeping it. Yeah. Well, I love where you're trying to take this. Um, uh, I'm just going to make a couple of very short comments in the interest of time and, and try to put this in a slightly broader context. So the, the, over the past, I don't know, 25 or 30 years, there have been thousands of local scale integrated conservation and development projects of various sorts in uh, you know, almost all tropical countries. Mm -hmm. And I found some of that through my research and I was amazed. It's, it's, <laughs> and some of them have been started by large international NGOs, some of them mm -hmm. have been started uh, uh, very locally uh, over the small number of partners, some of them have been supported by multilateral banks or other institutions um, or by the Agency for International Development. Very few of them still exist. The yeah. average lifespan of these initiatives is very it's smaller than the short of the lifespan yeah. of, I don't know, new restaurants at Harvard Square or something like that. <laughs> they're, 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 um, they're, they're, they're very short. And there are a lot of reasons for that. And there's been a, actually, a, there's an interesting literature that looks at the sustainability dimensions of these initiatives. And of course, you're trying to not just, you're trying to do many things, right? And you're adding the carbon climate layer onto it, both as, a, as an opportunity as well as, as, a, as a metric. Um, and that makes it that much more interesting and also and important. It also makes it that much more complicated. And, and so I want to encourage you to, to, without getting into the weeds of it here, draw upon the lessons of what has been learned, because there have been a number of kind of meta-analyses yeah. of these kinds of enterprises that I, I would encourage you to take a look at. And we could kind of I'm happy to point you to some of that literature. One of the things that I would also encourage you to do is to um, at least have conversations, if not potentially explore partnerships with some of the institutions who have been supporting other initiatives in Central America who have been successful by a range of indicators. And I, I'm not in a position, nor do I want to be, of promoting any institution. I'll just name one that I happen to know well that I encourage a conversation with. It's Ecological Development Fund, which is actually based here in right. Cambridge, mm -hmm. which does a lot of work, including from a carbon and climate lens um, in Central America, including Nicaragua and Honduras and I believe Panama. and. Um, you know, so they, they would have networks and experience and connections to funders that may or may not be a, a match, but but that's just an example of the kinds of conversations I'd encourage you to have so you can think through how to embed this in a broader fabric of experience and create creative opportunity than, than to try to go it alone. Excellent. I, in fact, I've already been thinking along those lines. Um, Seikali has been operating on their own for so long, they're very kind of insular. You know, it's it's their deal, and it's and it's uh, my intention as a former grant writer, understanding that when a foundation looks at a project, they want to see how many partners you have. They want to see how much bang for the buck they're going to get. Um, and so I understand that that is an in integral part of the system. And when I was looking at the different organizations that have been doing the reforestation, I immediately started thinking, well, the people who are doing the protection of the large reserva down there, the it, it's <coughs> losing a lot of trees and they're doing replanting and they're doing a lot of protection. I don't know if you're familiar with this organization, but they're pretty large and they and they have a lot of experience and so I've already been spinning the wheels on that. It's a matter of sitting down with say Kali with some others who speak Spanish and, and in bringing those organizations in and showing them how they can help lift them up. Because it is a little bit of a daunting task. They have bitten off a pretty big project, 750,000 acres or trees is, I mean, is huge. It's huge. So I agree. The more the merrier. Great. Well, good luck with it, and thank you. <laughs> thank you. I, I guess I should at least give an opportunity. If there's somebody with a burning point in the audience, I'd like to do so. Yes, back there. Why don't you take the microphone if you could from the table? Great. Um, thank you for oops, your, your talk. It was really interesting. I'm actually from Ecologic Development Fund, so I'd love to talk Beautiful. more with you afterwards. <laughs> My name is Andrea Savage, um, and uh, working on similar projects all over Central America, but the one that I specifically work on is in southern Mexico. And um, I know the type of work that you're doing is really challenging, so I applaud you, and it's, it's really energizing to hear 
um, the successes you've had. Um, so some of the questions I have is um, there's often a, a bit of a lag time um, before these sorts of projects start demonstrating socioeconomic benefits. Um, and um, I was wondering uh, what you have done to sort what the organization has done to sort of start to overcome some of those hurdles, if, you, if you've experienced them at all. Um, and then maybe one more question, um, uh, since you're talking about carbon sequestration, um, if you've started to look at all uh, to see if any of the um, sort of not so ecologically beneficial activities um, that you've uh, managed to prevent uh, in the in the uh, 750,000 hectares, um, if if you've looked into <coughs> see whether or not those activities have been displaced elsewhere, uh, those are two questions. Well, let me let me start with your last question. I'm, not, I'm make sure I'm clear. Um, with this project in particular, it's very low tech um, because labor is very cheap and people need jobs. Um, so there's, it's not like we're going to have a bunch of trucks hauling in a lot of trees. Everything is going to be pretty much on site. So you've got trees that are naturally seeding, as you know, you know, and you and you have people go and harvest those seedlings and transplant them out. Um, so it's it's really low tech, low impact. Um, does that sort of take care of that question? And I'm sorry, the previous question? Sorry. <laughs> sorry, I gave this up too soon. Um, yeah, so the, uh, since you are uh, managed to change practices in the area to conserve uh, forests, um, have you started to look to see if any of those practices have been displaced elsewhere to sort of ensure that um, your carbon sequestration abilities are, right, are good, strong. <laughs> yeah, good point. Um, part of the, the, through Twitter, when I Twitter, some of the things I say is it, it's no good to do all this reforestation unless we stop deforestation. So on a policy analysis level, I think part of the package needs to be that message. It needs to keep being honed in again and again. For example, Ecuador, I think it was Ecuador, just agreed to stop taking care of their, their bank for protecting the forest so they can sell it off to the oil companies, and that's very <coughs> devastating. Um, so on a local level, in Esteli, it's a matter of education and, and perhaps attracting people to come in with the stoves that are designed to now use half the amount of wood that they normally use for burning, and in some cases introduce solar ovens where it's applicable so they can stop burning wood altogether. Um, so there's a combination of things that need to happen that aren't directly related to planting a tree, but which help offset that, that issue of, well, yeah, it's great to plant all these trees, but on the other hand, you're going to go ahead and devastate these other areas. I mean, just a, a little quickie kind of an off-the-topic thing that is a great example of how this happens down there is Daniel Ortega accepted $20 million from the United Nations to help clean up the largest lake in Nicaragua, which they've been sending untreated effluent into, but at the same time, they permitted a land developer to put in a big pipe to dump his untreated effluent back into that lake. So there, it really is no good to give somebody money to clean something up if they're going to do this on not, the other end. Not good enough just to have the fishing rod. You have to be able to have and you have to have the agreements. You know, everybody has to understand what is the whole concept, and, and you have to work on both ends. And that's not something that Sekali is really prepared to do. But through the development of the proposal, there's the outreach to other organizations. There's the you know talking with the United Nations, and you know finding out well why is it that you're allowing Ecuador to go ahead and go back on their promise to protect this area. So there, there's. It's much bigger than planting trees. <laughs> thank you for the question. That was an important one. All right. Well, thank you again. So we are now going to move to the third and final of our uh, winning proposals. And now this is under the theme of reducing consumption and therefore um, greenhouse gas emissions um, from Francesca. Is it Francesca? Yes. Did I pronounce it right? Um, with the Cool Foods proposal. So please walk us through. Yes. So first time in the States, actually, and what better excuse to come over. Uh, I'm originally from Italy, but I've been working in Finland for the past six years. And there I'm now doing a PhD dealing with uh, sustainability of food consumption and uh, uh, in particular uh, meat consumption. And uh, 
last year I stepped out a little bit from the academic field and I was one of the finalists in this competition promoted by Barilla. I guess you are all familiar with the past maker. And uh, there I presented this idea for a new food label that uh, would uh, be based on the double pyramid model developed by the Barilla Center for Food and Nutrition where you have at the same time uh, information on the nutritional uh, value of food and their environmental impact. And on the basis of that I was contacted by the two other team members of this uh, proposal, uh, Diana Donlon, who is the uh, director of the Cool Foods campaign for the Center for Food Safety, and Gerard Bishop, who is the principal uh, scientist for the Beyond Zero Emissions in, uh, program in Australia. And um, so here we are. Uh, yeah, I think we can maybe show the video first and then go on from there. Hi, my name is Diana Donlin, and I am the director of the Cool Foods Campaign at the Center for Food Safety, a national nonprofit. I'm here in San Francisco, and I'm excited to tell you on behalf of our team about our climate <coughs> lab proposal. Our team consists of Gerard Bishop, who lives in Australia, Viv Baker, who lives in Florida, Francesca Aviani, who lives in Finland, and Patrick Briggs, my colleague here at the San Francisco office. Of Our idea is to empower consumers around their food choices to make a difference in the fight against global climate change. Global climate change is potentially very overwhelming to people, and they don't know what they can do about it on an ongoing basis. But food choices actually matter quite a bit because the food system globally accounts for 30% of our greenhouse gases. So we have a tremendous opportunity to change that through our food choices. And we'd like to propose that MIT CoLab help us come up with an app that people can use in the market so that when they buy food, they have a rating system and they know whether or not it's climate friendly because not all food is going to have the same carbon footprint. We're good at messaging, we're good at um, getting people excited about the opportunities around food, but we need your help with metrics so that when people are making these decisions, they will have some information in front of them that will enable them to do the climate smart thing. We wish our whole team was able to come to Cambridge and be with you for this wonderful conference and advocate for food solutions to climate problems. Thank you for this great opportunity. All right, well, thank you. That was a lovely video. So, uh, Jock. Great. Uh, so much as I think it's important to get out of the mail. My name is Dan I'm sorry, the first question's over. It, it, it rolled over. To oh, rolled over. Okay, great. So anyway, I, uh, much as it's important to get out in the field, it's also important to get out in markets and sort of have a sense of what's going on. I think your name, Cool Lab, branding is, 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 is a great name. And close to my heart, I think kind of stressing, we're so balkanized in how we look at things, so that anything that can really kind of embrace the notion of food and food systems has a huge bearing on both health, population health, and also on ecological well-being is very powerful. That, that crossover you find just isn't made. It's so sort of an obvious one, but funnily enough, it doesn't seem to be connected. So I think that that's, that's great. And I think also as the video mentions, when you talk about sort of climate, what can an individual do? So you can buy Prius, I suppose, but actually what you buy does have, you know, taking the Wendell Berry thing, it's an agricultural act, it's an ecological act too. And so I think there's something really great about that. However, labeling is very tricky. <laughs> it's really one of the most political and complicated things, partially just for fighting for the real estate, <laughs> but also fighting for the science for what the real estate says. And I think one of the questions would be, does it really work? And I think research, and I wouldn't pretend to be an expert on this, is that it does help guide people who are already converted to a certain direction. It guides them, but it doesn't necessarily change behavior. It's something already is going. It doesn't mean it shouldn't be done, but it's not going to solve everything. Um, the second thing is, of course, Getting the science right is tricky uh, because there are a lot of moving parts here to figure out. And there are a lot of offsets, uh, I think, which are, are important. I happen to be a big fan of down the road of hydroponics and sort of aquaponics and from, a, from an ecological standpoint and water standpoint, those things will score pretty well here. So I think these things do potentially have some interesting bearing on stuff that, that, uh, that, that's good. Um, the question of what to label is really tricky because 
we can take in just so much. And so the question of simplicity versus complexity is always there. Is it labor practices? Is it nutritional value? Is it you know fair trade? You name it, the stuff. And of course, the effect of the environment is a part. And so I have a thought that I wouldn't want to overdo is it sort of comes out of a college notion of the keystone species. And so people are trying to clear up the Columbia River and you've got the smelting plants, you've got the dams, and you've got the Indian rights and what's going on. People decided to focus on the salmon because in fact the salmon was something that got you ways of the way on each 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 of the steps. And so as a question, I don't have an answer to this, but it would be interesting to go through all the categories that matter and say when you consolidate here are the few things that you really want to get right. Because if you have too much in here, it's very hard to weight them, uh, I think, and, and, and tricky. And uh, so that's that's important. On the tech solution part, I think it's great in the sense that it appeals to a certain population that will use it. It also has, I think, a very clever way of potentially getting out of the real estate thing question here in terms of what actually gets on it, because you can overlay, you can use that. So I think that's very good. On the other hand, the downside, of course, is that change is going to come when you get to Walmart. And, and they're the biggest grocer <laughs> in, in the country, perhaps, perhaps the world. And so having a technique that can kind of make things far more accessible to more people down the road, I think, is, uh, is, is, really, is really important. Um, I think in terms of the science of it all, um, clearly coming up with your own metrics, I think, is, a, is too daunting, frankly. And so it's taking a meta approach where you can kind of Consolidate different perspectives. I think it's a smart way to do it, and be kind of the brand. The brand uh, would would be would be important. Um, and I, you know, I'd obviously there's. Oh, the final thing I'd say is that the question is whether you take a guerrilla approach and work outside the system, or you work internally within the system. Because there's certainly uh, people can dislike Whole Foods or whatever, but they've taken this branding thing and made a big deal out of it. And so, and and so it may not be a bad idea to to kind of get inside the system and figure out how you can get people to collaborate in their own interest to kind of make it easier to, to do. But I think you're dealing with something so central if you can't manage it, you know, measure you can't manage it. And so I think it's a it's kind of exciting but yeah. very daunting and very challenging. Yeah, process. absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, I completely agree with you about the complexity of the problem. And personally, I think it would be, I mean, here we focus mainly on, on greenhouse gas emissions, yeah. but I think it would be very important to take into account, for example, also the land use perspective, uh, the water use perspective. Uh, they are essential elements as well. Uh, but at the same time, how do you convey right. that information to the average consumer who's probably not even aware that the, pr that the problem is so complex? So you still have to aggregate all that information into a number or a letter, something right. that is very easy to read, very easy to understand for anybody. So I think uh, the way I see it, the, the best solution would be to uh, Ha do have the aggregated uh, rating, but still offer the opportunity to open up the box and look yes. into like yeah, what's yeah. behind it. Uh, but yes, of course, it's it's. I, I see your point. I mean, it's 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 a matter of okay, what do you keep there? What do you talk about? And uh, what metrics do you use? And so on. It's a dynamic so. system that's got transparency to it. Anything yes, go yes. That. And about the the last uh, comment you had about the, the branding and so on, I think. Uh, Maybe another another thing that can make these uh, apps successful would be um, uh, to you know have some kind of gaming going on. Like also in the proposal, we were suggesting to couple this with a cool foods campaign. Like it's it's already ongoing, but to enhance it even further and maybe have this like uh, cool cities. Uh, Competing against each other in a way, or maybe develop the app so that you can, you know, update your cool score on Facebook or things like that. I mean, that's that's how sure. how you know most people work nowadays. So, and the way I see it is that it's very difficult to uh, bring all that information, aggregate all that information. But uh, no matter how much information we we will be able to bring there. It will still be better than nothing. And just to use this to, you know, fill in the gap between uh, the information that is available right now uh, within the literature, uh, which is so vast, and what the average consumer know. I mean, to be able to fill in that gap a bit, I think it's there is great potential there. And one very one one word. Sorry, is it? I think clearly, if you look at all these food maps, obesity is more of a health thing. That the biggest issues are clearly the poorer neighborhoods all around the world, basically in this country as well. And so thinking about how you can kind of over time at least migrate towards that serving that kind of population, I think is really very important. Yeah. Okay. No. 
Um, thanks for this interesting presentation, and I, I think your, yours had the second nicest music with the <laughs> <laughs> big, San Francisco big bells in the background. That was great. Very lovely. Um, so I, 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 I want to kind of, I guess, repeat the uh, the value of connecting uh, environmental impacts, health. Um, and making that all closer to top of mind for a consumer. And also agree, as I think we're all aware, that consumers, you know, there's uh, some statistic about making half a second to, to taking half a second to make a decision in the yes. grocery store. Yeah, or, yes. um, maybe it's even less than that and slightly more for Whole Foods shoppers, I'm sure. Um, so, uh, well, <laughs> that's, certainly a, that's certainly a metric many people pay attention to. Um, so uh, you're, you're aware of some of the challenges of, of this kind of an effort, but the, the big picture effort of making a connection in consumers' minds about something that you, uh, that you can do, uh, people, as, as you mentioned, are looking for ways to have an impact, and food choices is certainly one of them. Um, so an effort that gets at some of that, I think, I think is excellent. Um, just as uh, you may have looked at some of these already, but just to, to bring up some examples that the audience might find interesting as well, um, the, the Good Guide app, which uh, yeah, started heard about it. from yeah. a professor yes. at Berkeley and is now owned by right. UL, is, um, shows some similarities. So I, yes, I'm, I'm absolutely. Was pretty sure you'd, you'd seen that. Yeah. And that uh, is certainly a good example to look to for uh, app design, mm -hmm. for some of the metrics, for how they deal with issues of transparency, how they deal with issues of um, funding and partnerships with corporations. Yeah. So it's, that's certainly an interesting kind of case study with some similarity. Um, as for kind of a, a cool food theme, um, I'd also take a look at, at BAMCO, the um, Bon Appetit Management mm -hmm. Company, which is primarily in food service. But they've done some very innovative uh, work trying to trying to make uh, climate impacts of food accessible to um, well, basically to an to an undergraduate audience. Right. Okay. So they've done some some very clever work there. They do. For, yes, that's right. That's right. So uh, another interesting company to to look at. And and then um, I think more. They, they are the future yeah, back for Google. Right, right. Um, uh, and then the Environmental Working Group, uh, has, which is uh, based locally, they've done, I um, believe it was last year, published a report called The Meat Eater's Guide to Climate and Health, um, which did, uh, they, <laughs> which was a very intentional title um, <laughs> to try to try to reach uh, a different audience. That one did. I, I happen to know the the company, the organization that was behind the metrics that they used to to sort of rate the climate impact of different meat or protein choices. Um, they did excellent work. It was very complicated. The I mean the behind the scenes work to get just that list of twenty uh, ranked was. Um, a substantial investment of time and money and just data, just the amount of data, because the permutations uh, get enormous very quickly, and you have to make a lot of assumptions. Um, so along those lines, I just want to mention a concern that occurs to me, especially as I'm uh, working more with cocoa and coffee farmers um, in developing countries, is, a, is a, a fear of the potential for more harm than good in disrupting the uh, disrupting the economic sustainability of farmers who live more than 500 kilometers away from, from a consumer, but who may in fact be farming in a very ecologically sound way. Um, this comes up more with, with boiling down to a, a very particular metric of, of food miles. Um, so that doesn't sound like it's exactly what you're doing. But there are, it's worth thinking about whether, whether there are elements in your, in your logarithm that might have the potential to cause more uh, more harm than good. And my own experience as a, a co-developer of the Cool Farm Tool, which is a greenhouse gas emissions calculator for farm scale, for farm management practices, um, we learned that in some cases, the farms that had less data to offer scored better. Um, because they are simply not reporting as yes. many of the impacts that they have. So that would be certainly a concern to keep in mind. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally, totally agree with that, and I think those are those are other points to be taken into account. And regarding the first, the first part of what you were saying, I think that uh, this 
to give this idea that I can do something and I can do something that has an impact today, it's quite central to this question because we know that if we would have changes in the food demand side, then there would be, this would imply changes in the agricultural side. And because, I mean, we saw in the video agriculture is uh, responsible for about 30% of the greenhouse gas emissions, but that's an underestimation because it doesn't take into account of all the like short-lived emissions. So if we would take those into account as well, the figure would be even greater. So to really be able to to give this message that if you, you know, if you take a different choice today, it it, it does have an impact on the climate today. I think this would be this would be good. But uh, but yeah, but I agree with the other points you raised. Yes. So thank you for this. The, you know the the uh, the allure of providing consumers with easily accessible, simplified but not simple information upon which to make choices that scaling up really matter with respect to climate or any other environmental issue is, is very powerful and I really, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm thrilled you're taking this on. It is also, as, you're, as we're talking about, kind of enormously daunting mm. to figure out what's yes. the sweet spot between <laughs> accessibility, um, uh, scientific robustness, uh, you know, and impact. Uh, an audience, and uh, it's something that I've thought a lot about. My organization, the Unit Concerned Scientists, has wrestled with um, information available to consumers across a range of products, including food, about how to how to help them make smart environmental choices. Uh, we, I'll just say a couple things about it. Several years ago, we came out with a book on that topic, and ended up really trying to separate for people which choices really matter. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you're in the marketplace, it just doesn't really matter whether you're buying paper versus plastic for example, and people might just sweat over that, and yeah. versus other things like the kind of car you buy, um, or cloth versus um, uh, uh, disposable diapers if you're a parent. It just, you know, when you just look at the total impacts, there are many different impacts, it, it's just not that important, right? So kind of sweat the important things mm -hmm. and not the small things was an important part of what we've been trying to do. And we came out with a more recent book that really looks at it through a, a carbon lens specifically. So shameless plug, plug, forgive me, this was last year, called Cooler Smarter, which looks at a range of uh, the carbon consequences of okay. uh, consumer choices. I'm happy to give you this if you'd like, um, uh, 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 including food choices. And we wrestled with the notion, wrestled really hard with the notion about whether we could do something like what, what you are all doing. And we came to a different conclusion, so I want to kind of share that with you. Um, uh, and there's a chapter on, in, in this book on it. And, and in looking at the data, sort of where the science is about the carbon consequences of food choices. Um, some of the things we might have wanted to highlight, so for example, local or organic, which are both good for many different reasons, turn out to be, as, I, as you may well know, um, not very, very muddled with respect to the carbon consequences. Right? It's not always the case that local or uh, organic is better mm -hmm. than distant or uh, you know, pesticide ridden. Uh, <laughs> right? And fresh versus frozen. So, so those choices which are important, don't necessarily um, line up with the carbon or climate goal that we're talking about here. Um, and so you could go through and look at them on a case-by-case -case basis and mm -hmm. see where the data are and where they aren't and end up coming up with a very complicated kind of underpinning of a rating system. Where we ended up was, was and we haven't done this in a marketing sense, so I'll just share this with you and maybe it's something that would connect to what you're doing, ended up highlighting, well, what are the choices that really matter? All right, mm -hmm. what are the big choices? Um, and I'll just name the ones that we came away looking at the literature on. So, and I think they're probably familiar to most of you, but not necessarily familiar to consumers. So let me just highlight. You know, one is um, uh, eating less meat, particularly beef, eating less cheese for the same reason, right? Because uh, cattle and dairy cattle inclusive, by and large, have a very large carbon impact, right? That's one. You know, a second is less packaging, right? Buy thing, all else being equal, buy things with less packaging. Kind of a simple thing, but not something that people necessarily think about. Um, uh, 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 food miles don't matter so much unless they're air freighted, right? Right. right? right. So if there's a way of highlighting for, for things where they're where they're you know uh, uh, tropical cut plants, for example, so so um, or, or, or fruits that are that are brought in uh, by air freight. So if there's a way of helping people identify which things tend to be air freighted, right? Very big carbon footprint. So and there are a couple of others, but my my encouragement is to think about. You know, and this may not require an app, right? It may and may be more amenable to people in, in, in a range of socioeconomic contexts. But to just, what are the you know the five things you should know, yes. right? Going into the supermarket, so that they're just front and center. You don't have to look at an app to do them. Yeah. You don't have to kind of read a long list. There doesn't have to be a, a detailed, accessible uh, reporting on them. But all else being equal, you do these five things, and 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 you know you could then calculate. We haven't done this what the average reduction in 
in carbon uh, uh, impact of you know the average Americans, for example, or the average uh, Italians or Finnish uh, food food choice would be right, and yes. and help people come up with something simple in their busy lives. They just kind of have that as a as a mental uh, uh, paradigm by which they make more smarter choices. And I, so my encouragement is to I know it's different from where you've taken this, mm -hmm. but to imagine something that might just make it easier for people without making it complicated for yourself. Mm -hmm. I had one analogy to that, I think it's sure. really appropriate. It has, you know, if you look at the 19th century, what really revolutionized public health was Ignacy Weiss, who was uh, uh, Hungarian in Austria, who's the one uh, that decided you've got to wash your hands, basically. And yeah. essentially, it's a very simple thing. It probably just saved as many people as you right. could imagine instead of these doctors going down to the mortuary coming up to deliver. Uh, babies. And so and it's not because complexity doesn't matter. Complexity does involve really understanding. I'm sure I know on the basis of what you guys do, there's a lot of science behind it. But in terms of behavioral change, keeping something simple message-wise is really, as long as it's credible. And that was one that was based on data and things like that. So there's a lot to be said for kind of some simple rules that are predicated on some very, very powerful ways of thinking. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's why the, to have the app paired with the cool food campaign would be would be so important because it would uh, fill in the like the education part of this. Like, uh, why are you using this app? And uh, of course, then I mean, as we as we talked in the beginning, we we can go on talking all day about okay, what are the th things that you should look into the app? But if you don't get the message first about how it is important to make right. different choices in terms of food consumption, then right the rest is useless. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I completely agree with that and uh, I think, in, um, I mean, it's important from the greenhouse gas emissions, it's important from the water use perspective as well because uh, on average of all the water we, we use in the Western world uh, daily, about 90% comes from the water that is embedded in food production. Mm -hmm. And how many people are aware of that? Because there is so much discussion, for example, about, okay, close the tap water when you're brushing your teeth and that sort of action, which of course it's, it's, it's relevant, but what about, you know, the, the water that is used to produce beef? I mean, so just to, to bring up all these points would be would be important and to just have, as you said, just few rules would well, be... Well, a quick one involves waste. And so yeah. you're drinking fruits and vegetables, it's well over 50%. Um, and there's a long, <laughs> low cost waste. A lot of it is also in, in the supermarkets when something looks a little ugly or it's not kind of these by dates mm -hmm. and ways of using technology to point quickly to where stuff is available right now that can be lower price and just a way to kind of get the things. So there's a lot less waste, I think, would be useful yes. in a lot of... For a lot of different reasons. Yeah, sure. Let me open this up to our uh, our audience. Any comments, questions for uh, this proposal, Francesca? Uh, Please, if you can introduce yourself yeah. as well. Um, Laura Smead. I work for the City of Cambridge Planning Great. Department. Um, I just had a. Um, I just thought it was interesting as you were talking about the combination of the messaging component that there is, in addition to the intersection um, between health and reducing greenhouse gas emissions, there's also, I mean, if we're trying to market to um, folks who are struggling, you know, to with their grocery bills every month, eating less meat, eating less cheese, eating bulk rice and beans, I mean, eating you know, um, maybe not the tropical fruits that, I mean, or selecting those um, for a special treat, especially if they're some of your native foods or something that you're missing. Um, but all of those are going to save you money at the end of the day, too. And, and also maybe um, in the future, some of these corporations like Walmart are really, seems like they're trying to make so much more of an effort on the... Uh, you know, uh, on the sustainability side for their own self-serving interests, I'm sure, but you can use that to your advantage and perhaps uh, sort of have interesting partnerships with mm. larger mm -hmm. grocery store chains, either, I mean, not necessarily in the United States, but maybe it's easier in other countries to do some of that direct labeling. So when you're making that half-second decision yeah. and you perhaps don't have a smartphone, you can be like, oh, look at that. It's Good for my wallet and good for the environment and good for my waistline. <laughs> so. That's a great point. It's true. McDonald's which doesn't do so much with meat, there's a lot of fish. It's had a very good reputation with Alaskan Pollock and the like. And they've been certified and just don't want to be branded with it for some strange reason. They don't want that kind of, I don't know quite why. 
And uh, uh, but anyway, so there's something you can find very quickly. They do a very good job on the fish, not so good on the meat, and you can differentiate. So I think all that kind of information is is, is great to get, and also in the trouble spots of our system in the, in the uh, fast food area. Yes. Thank you for that. Any other comments from the uh, audience? Yes. Um, again, I have a lot of boys. <laughs> <laughs> can you introduce yourself? Um, my name is Jordan Rogoff. Um, I just wanted to tell you guys quickly about a project that I'm working on um, at the Media Lab in the Center for New Cities. It's called the MIT City Farm. And um, it's a tiny lab. It's pretty new, but we are exploring what it means um, technologically, environmentally, and socially to build scale, um, scalably industrial systems for um, really dense urban areas. Um, and right now we have a small um, system set up with aquaponics, hydroponics, and aeroponics. And we're having our first harvest next week. We're going to have a big dinner. Um, anyways, it's a super cool project. And I just wanted to invite people um, while you're in town or people that are uh, part of the community already just to come check out the lab. Come talk to me if you want to see it. Um, I know we've seen plenty of renderings, architectural renderings of vertical farms and, and everything. And so we're just trying to figure out how we really make that happen. And um, GSD, I would, yeah. So I think cool if I miss, this one about sort of the vertical farms is a very good look at it. And we just see that stuff. But I think it's, there's a lot to that, a lot more than people think. Yeah. Like, 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 and especially as it relates to the issues we're talking about. That's a great thing. Come check it. If you guys want to see yeah. it, it's, it's really a great looking place. Well, Thank you for that, and uh, we're at the close of our uh, time. I want to thank everybody for coming. I don't know if we had anybody. Did anybody have anybody online? No. We had a few people looking. Just, just listening in? OK, well, that's fine. Um, I've enjoyed this yeah, tremendously, so. and I we owe a tremendous amount of gratitude for all of our panelists and their collaborators for submitting these all winning proposals. I guess there'll be a grand prize, but you're all winners. So, yeah. so uh, <laughs> it's all great. So thank you all. Front end of experimenting with this kind of work. Absolutely. I hope you've learned a little bit from this dialogue. And uh, I want to thank Jock and Christina for joining me on the panel and offering their insights. So uh, thank you all for coming. Or comment. Like you suggested, going with some things, one of those things might be identified GMO. Oh, thanks.